Okay, so one more video on Peter Schiff's Joe Rogan interview. This time on the banking regulations portion. I think this section is important, because I can see how people would be fooled by the false narrative by omission. This is important to debunk, because these false narratives mislead people into believing a false version of history. Peter Schiff is about to repeat the narrative that the banking sector was stable before the implementation of FDIC and then blame the FDIC for the banking failures that happened nearly half a century after its implementation. Schiff is going to ignore the infamous banking runs and massive panics that happened before the FDIC, and admit that the banking failures in the 80s happened after certain banking restrictions that were implemented along with the FDIC were actually lifted. And so this false narrative by omission is that things were fine when we left the free market to make these decisions, and then crumbled when the government got involved. Unfortunately, some people simply accept narratives like these without bothering to fact-check them. This leads to a growing misunderstanding of basic civics, and how our institutions actually make it possible to run largely interconnected societies. So here we go. Do you, and you feel like this applies to everything? This applies to all businesses pretty, all the time? I mean, pretty much. I mean, we don't need government, you know, having these certifications. I mean, the private sector is, is certainly capable. At this point. I mean, look. Is, is it consideration social media and uh, holding people accountable, like uh, holding businesses accountable for their actions? And, like, it's a different world in terms of, like, the ability to, like, alert consumers as to what's good and what's bad. It's a different world when but, it comes to that kind of thing. But people, especially now with the internet, yeah. I mean, if a business isn't any good, I mean, it's right. going to get a bad reputation That's online. I mean, you're going to have... Well, the internet isn't a coherent document of accurate and unbiased information. It's an endless chaotic labyrinth of data, much of it false. People don't necessarily know which websites to believe. Companies can and do pay for positive reviews. Review sites can prioritize companies that advertise, and the average website visitor will be none the wiser. So it's not as simple as Schiff makes it sound. Consumer reports that go out and rate, look, look at what happens. Like, look at the banks, right? The banks are completely regulated by the government. No, not completely. Beginning in the 1980s, the government began to undo some of the regulations introduced in response to the Great Depression, such as Glass-Steagall. So in fact, these bank failures actually coincide with deregulation. But more on that later. Right, everybody who opens up a bank account knows that the government is guaranteeing their deposit. That wasn't always the case. That The deposit insurance didn't start until the 1930s because of the bank failures in the Great Depression, which were minimal. No, they were not minimal. Even though we didn't have FDIC, we had other lenders of last resort, such as JP Morgan and the Federal Reserve. And during the Great Depression, nearly one half of the nation's banks disappeared. Prior to the introduction of the FDIC, bank runs and financial panics were fairly commonplace. Panics would lead people to withdraw their money, which would set off a chain reaction. Whether the panic was merited or not, was irrelevant. The herd mentality would take over like wildfire. I mean, fewer than 2% of the banks actually failed. There was Schiff claims that only 2% of the banks failed. It's not clear what time frame he's referring to, but during the Great Depression, nearly one half of the banks failed. It wasn't that much in the way, of, and we had a lot of banks, way more banks than we have now. Now we just have these massive banks. Before the government got involved, we had a very, very competitive market. We had lots of little banks out there uh, taking deposits, making loans to entrepreneurs uh, to start businesses and employ people, not you know funding Wall Street. Okay, so what? We also went from having countless mom and pop retail stores selling to their neighborhoods to a retail industry run by Valmarts and other retail giants, not to mention e-commerce giants. Right, but, but do you, re you remember time, the savings and loans collapse? Yeah. For sure you do, right? Yeah, but that was but those banks had government guarantees. Right. That was the problem. That so was the before problem. Before the government Okay, 
so the savings and loan crisis happened in the 80s, and Schiff is blaming a policy that began in the 1930s. Why? Simple. Because the 80s is when the 1939 bank regulations would begin to unravel. So first, we have the Monetary Control Act of 1980, and this ended banks from paying interest on many kinds of deposits. Then there was the Garn St. Germain Act of 1982 which relaxed restrictions on the manner of loans banks could make. In 1986, the savings and loans crisis would happen, and we can definitely map this to the Garn St. Germain Act of 1982. So while the FDIC continued in place, the government restrictions on what banks could do with depositor money would not. So yes, we can reasonably blame the deregulation of this problem. In fact, these 40 years of strong regulation is known as the quiet period, where there were relatively few banking problems. Schiff omits these decades because it doesn't fit the narrative. Right, before the government guaranteed banks, before you would put your money in a bank, you would do a little research, just like you do research now before you buy a car. You, you, you try to figure out which is the best bank for my money, which bank is the safest, which bank, you know, is in, you know, having problem loans. And you would you would consult, you know, periodicals or, you know, reviews online, you know, not online, but you would find out where the, the banks were good and, and you would put your money in that bank. And now the banks would have to compete on reputation. Right because the average person working their full-time job and taking care of their children was also an expert on the banking industry, and knew which periodical to trust. I mean seriously, people who spend their entire lives eating, sleeping, and breathing this stuff often get this stuff very wrong. For example, here is Peter Schiff in 2010, predicting a financial crisis in 2012 and gold rising to $5,000 an ounce probably more likely but i think sometime in 2011 if we make it out of 2011 maybe 2012 that we're going to have a crisis you know they didn't have a crisis in ireland last year they still have the euro almost as weak as the dollar and you know now i might have to say instead of just going to five thousand maybe gold's going to ten thousand and i know somebody there said why isn't it obviously that didn't happen so the idea that the average Joe was ever in any position to just pick up a periodical and get his or her head around the banking industry is ridiculous. Furthermore, Schiff's narrative assumes that the only reason a bank could potentially go under was due to bad investments, is simply wrong. Bank runs would happen for multiple reasons and they often spilled over to other banks. Think of them like house fires. Your neighbor's house fire can easily spread to yours and the entire neighborhood. And this is the problem with not just Peter Schiff's narrative. It's filled with a bunch of nice one-liners that sound clever in sound bites, look nice on bumper stickers and fit neatly within a tweet but have little to no basis in reality and are sorely refuted by history, reason, and well, reality. The government wouldn't bail them out, their depositors would lose money, so we had a very sound banking system. Uh, back then. Today, it's very unsound. The banks are doing all sorts of reckless things with their deposits because no one gives a damn. Well, not no one. There are politicians that have been looking to bring back the policies that would keep banks from gambling with depositor money but their bills never seem to pass. What tepid reforms were made with the Dodd-Frank bill under Obama were butchered under the Trump administration. Here is Kyle Kulinski, of Secular Talk reacting to this because the bare minimum of what they're supposed to do would say uh the senate deregulate votes to deregulate wall street this kind of legislation led to the great depression and the stock market crash in 1929 and it led to the subprime mortgage crisis and the great recession in 2008 historically whenever you deregulate and cut taxes for the rich which is exactly what we've done Anytime you do that, uh, you have what's called a boom-bust cycle. So everything takes off, and everybody's like, oh my god, the economy's great, the good times are never gonna end, and then the bubble bursts, and then everything tanks. I mean, we just went through this. We fucking just went through this. And by the way, Dodd-Frank, all it was, was a band-aid with a little bit of ointment over a gaping, gangrenous wound. 
that didn't really fully address the root uh, problem with what was going on. I mean, we didn't even get, after the 2008 crash, we didn't even get Glass-Steagall implemented. We couldn't even get Glass-Steagall. I mean, that was a no-brainer. Oh, you have to put back into place Glass-Steagall. We didn't even get that. We got this watered-down, giant loophole bill, Dodd-Frank, which is barely a half measure, if that, and now they're trying to take away every single decent part of that that remains. By the way, in this bill, we discussed it in the last se segment, but just to give you an idea, uh, they weaken the leverage rules, of course. One of the main things that's going to lead to another problem. Now they define a, a small bank, anything that $250 billion worth or less. It was $50 billion uh, dollars or less. And it used to be that banks that had $50 billion or more, well, they're going to be regulated more uh, strictly so that we don't, we make sure that we don't take risks that are going to crash the fucking economy again. Well, now they said, no, let's up that cap from $50 billion to $250 billion. And they say, it's okay, because we're only, we're only making life easier for small community banks. Community? What the fuck are you talking about? You know who uh, one of the companies are that benefits as a result of this? That small community uh, institution known as American Express. So, they're just... They're going to fucking crash the economy again. They just put it on steroids and human growth hormone. We were already going to face another giant crash. Now it's just going to come even sooner. And they act like, we don't, this is the right thing to do because my donors paid me to do it. Shameful. Listen, the Humanist Report made a great point about this on Twitter. He said, when it crashes again, all the senators who voted and the congresspeople who voted uh, to deregulate further, have them pay for the entire bailout. Have them pay for it. Because what's going to happen is it's going to crash again and they're going to come begging to the American people, to taxpayers. Well, we got to, well, we have no choice. Who could have seen this coming, this crash? Who could have seen it coming and now we have to bail them out? How about go fuck yourself? How about you bail them out? How about that? Because we already bailed them out once and we got hosed in the process. Regular people haven't gotten a raise since 1980. Our wages have been stagnant since 1980. Half of workers in America make $30,000 a year or less. And the greed and recklessness of Wall Street, they crashed the economy, bankrupted their own companies, and then the government goes, well, since they pay us our political donations, we're going to make regular people bail them out. So just regular taxpayers with normal jobs. Oh, please. If you own a fucking deli, or if you own a dry cleaners, or you own a, a small grocery store, and you go under, government doesn't come in and fucking rush to help you. But if you own a giant hedge fund, and you're making casino capitalist bets, and then you crash your own company and the economy, we have to turn around and bail you out? Fuck that shit. Are you kidding me? But this, it's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again. And shame on the fucking Democrats. They couldn't have gotten this done if it wasn't for the Democrats. They couldn't have gotten it done. And the fucking media describes it as a rare bipartisan accomplishment. How lazy, how lazy do you have to be as a journalist to not do basic research to find out that historically, deregulation crashes the economy. It happens time and time and time again. Cut taxes for the rich, deregulate, giant crash. It happens all the time. And the media, instead of educating you, it's just discussing this as, it's an accomplishment because Democrats and Republicans agree. I don't give a fuck if Democrats and Republicans agree. Have you noticed, by the way, that Congress has an approval rating of uh, anywhere between 14% and 21%? Have you noticed that? 